Hi guys, Kieran here and welcome back to A Clever Chimp. Today I'm going to be showing you three experiments that you can do at home using household supplies that show the immense power of the atmosphere. And stick around because I've saved the best experiment till last, but <laughs> in all honesty, I'm just amazed by all of them. <laughs> If you're a child and you're watching this, I do recommend you go and get some adult supervision to do these experiments. But even if you're an adult and you're watching this and you have to stop for a second to question whether you're an adult or not, you should probably go and get another adult, you know? It can't hurt. Anyway, let's jump into it. All right, so the first experiment asks the question, is there a limit to how long a straw can be that you can still take a drink out of it using just the power of your lungs? You know, as if you're breathing in the liquid. It's quite difficult to do anyway with just a normal straw. So to find this out, we're going to need a longer one. So to make this long straw, we're going to need to connect a bunch of other straws together. Now you may already be pretty crafty and have your own way of doing this, but this is the way in which I do it. The most important thing, however, is to make sure that at every joint it's completely sealed. We need to make sure that this long straw is completely sealed so that it actually functions properly. And you're gonna wanna keep doing this until you have a straw that's about 120 centimeters long. Right then, once you have your stupidly long straw and your drink, it's time to give it a go. Now you can either mark out on your straw certain distances or you can use a tape measure like I'm doing to see how high you can get the liquid to go. Now remember, for this experiment, you need to be using your lungs to try and take a drink from the straw as if you're breathing in the liquid. Let's give it a go. <sighs> ah. I didn't get anything. I didn't get anything out of that drink. Why is this so hard to do? Allow me to explain. Above us is an ocean of air pressing down on us and in on us. And to help you visualize that, I'm gonna be using some marshmallows. What I want you to imagine I'm building here are little slabs of the atmosphere. As I build the atmosphere higher, you can see the marshmallows on the bottom layer are under more pressure than those above them. You can also notice that on each layer, the marshmallows are under less and less pressure as you increase in height. This is essentially a model of our atmosphere and we're the marshmallows on the bottom layer. Now that we understand the atmosphere a little bit better, let's go back to the question at hand. Initially, the surface of the fluid inside and outside the straw are both at atmospheric pressure. When you go to take a drink, you decrease the air pressure above the surface of the fluid inside the straw. This then creates a pressure imbalance where the atmospheric pressure is now greater and pushes the fluid up the straw, going from high pressure to low pressure, seeking a pressure balance. This pressure balance means that the combined pressure of what's in your lungs plus what's called the hydrostatic pressure of the level of fluid that's raised in the straw is equal to the atmospheric pressure pressing down on the fluid surface outside of the straw. But that then means that there's a pressure difference between inside and outside of my lungs, which we know from this pressure balance to be equal to the hydrostatic pressure of the fluid. Now, assuming that the area that expands on my chest when I breathe is 1,200 centimeters squared, that equates to a force that would be similar to the weight of 120 kilograms pressing in on your chest. And it's for this reason that it's incredibly difficult for anybody to be able to suck liquid up a straw using just the power of their lungs any further than about one meter. Now I find that fascinating. Even just the notion that drinking through a straw is more of a push than a pull. Anyway, let's move on to the next experiment. Now in this experiment, we're going to be making a simple siphon. Now some of you may not have ever seen a siphon work up close or even know what one is, but believe me, it's a brilliant counterintuitive physical marvel. It's one of my favorite demonstrations in fluid mechanics. In a nutshell, a siphon transfers fluid from a container up over a wall into another lower container. And once started, 
uses nothing but gravity to keep on going. So for this, you're going to need to attach two straws again, but make sure that you attach them at the bendy ends and then bend it into a U shape. Now make sure and have a container of fluid that has a water level higher than the receiving container of fluid. Next, you're going to need to start the siphon. To do this, you're going to have to suck liquid up into the straw and then quickly place it into the receiving container and then watch the magic happen. Like, isn't that just amazing? I'm transferring liquid from this glass to this glass up over a wall, up. Like it just doesn't, it feels like it should be defying physics and it shouldn't be working. It just, oh, it just baffles me every single time. So what's actually going on here then? Well, at first glance, you might think that the liquid is being pulled from the first container into the second container like a rope or a chain but that would be relying on the fluid's tensile capabilities, which in this scenario are actually playing a very little part. Well, in that case, how is the fluid being transported? Well, let's break it down. Initially, the fluid in the first container, both inside and outside the straw, is exposed to atmospheric pressure. We then fill up the straw and drop it into the other container. Now, it's the end of the straw and the fluid outside of the straw in the first container that's exposed to the atmosphere. Well, in that case, there's a pressure balance, right? Because you have atmospheric pressure on one side and atmospheric pressure on the other. Well, not quite, because if you look at the hydrostatic pressures in either of the straws, the yellow straw has a higher hydrostatic pressure than the red straw because it's taller from where the atmospheric pressure is acting. This then means that the hydrostatic pressure in the yellow straw is acting against the atmospheric pressure in that glass more so than the hydrostatic pressure in the red straw acting against the atmospheric pressure in its glass. This means then that there is in fact a pressure difference from the higher glass to the lower glass and fluid will flow until the pressures balance. The atmospheric pressure plus the hydrostatic pressure of both of the straws is equal. And so there you have it, even the mechanism of the siphon is more of a push than a pull. And hey, if you're enjoying the video and you want to see more of me doing these kind of experiments, then consider subscribing to the channel. And those of you that want to learn a little bit more of the maths behind these experiments, comment your interest down below. Right, for the next experiment we need to go to the kitchen. Okay, for this experiment, you're going to need to use a pan to heat up an open, empty drinks can with a little bit of water in it. You also are going to need to prepare a bowl of ice and water. So two things I recommend you use during this experiment, one being some tongs, because we're going to be flipping that hot can over into the bowl of icy water, and two, some safety glasses because there might be some residue boiling water in the can and we don't want that spraying out anywhere so it's best to wear some safety glasses. So we need to wait until there's a good amount of water vapour coming out of the top of that can. So whilst that's heating up let's have a little talk about what's going on here. Initially when the can is empty with a little bit of water in the bottom of it both the inner and outer walls of the can are exposed to the atmosphere. This means that the air molecules in the atmosphere are bouncing off of the walls, applying a force each time they do. And that force over that area is what gives us our atmospheric pressure. If we were to then heat up the can and therefore heat up the water, boiling it, turning it into water vapor, the water vapor fills up the can and near enough replaces the air inside the can. So there's a couple of important things to note about the water vapor in the can, and that is that it fills the whole can from just the few drops that you put in initially, and it's matching the atmospheric pressure because the water molecules are going far faster and they're bouncing off the walls sufficiently fast to provide a sufficient amount of force to match the atmospheric pressure on the outside of the can. So now we have to ask ourselves, what would happen if we were to seal the can and cool it? Well, all of the gaseous water molecules in the water vapor would start slowing down. They would be knocking into the walls of the can, which is now colder than them, and they would be losing energy to the can. 
and therefore they would be slowing down and they would start to condense and turn back into liquid water. This would then mean that they are no longer able to apply that force against the inner walls of the can. And there's no way for any extra air to come and rush in and do the job. This then means that there's a huge pressure difference between the atmospheric pressure on the outside of the can and basically barely any pressure on the inside of the can. The question then becomes whether or not the can is strong enough to withstand atmospheric pressure pushing in on its sides. Well, let's find out. Watching that can get annihilated never gets old. And what a way to finish this video, witnessing the incredible crushing power of the atmosphere. Thank you very much for watching guys, and as always, I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.